well, it's a balmy day in D.C. for, for this time of year. Um, we're really glad to have you all uh, with us. This is um, this on-topic uh, forum. Uh, Judge Ken Starr started these a few years ago at Baylor. And uh, among the uh, interlocutors for on-topic, uh, T. Boone Pickens, Condoleezza Rice, Sandra Day O'Connor, George Mitchell, Oz Guinness, Alan Dershowitz, which we co-sponsored uh, with Georgetown University. Juan Williams was in Waco not too long ago, up to tonight with Richard Joel and John Garvey. Uh, John Barry, who was mentioned a few moments ago, actually came up with the idea for this night after reading a piece by Richard Joel in the Huffington Post uh, about higher education. And uh, so we thought, why not get uh, a few folks together to talk about higher education? And so here we are. Um, our speakers, uh, Richard Joel and John Garvey, our interlocutors, uh, I'm going to be brief in introducing them. One of the things I would encourage you to do, and also with Judge Ken Starr, is to go to their websites. Uh, they have all written quite a bit, and they are uh, uh, tremendously articulate, both uh, in verbal and written forms. And they've written a lot about the issues that they will be discussing tonight. So I encourage you to go to their websites uh, at their universities and read the speeches they've given, uh, the essays that they've published in various arenas. Richard Joel has served as president of Yeshiva University since 2003 and was named a university professor in 2010. During the past 10 years, he has built upon the illustrious tradition of Yeshiva University by placing a renewed emphasis on the student experience, academic excellence, Torah scholarship, and communal involvement. He is a graduate of New York University, where he earned a BA and a JD, and was a Root Tilden Scholar. He has received honorary doctorates from Boston Hebrew College and Gratz College. John Garvey. Uh, I'm especially happy to be introducing John. We were colleagues at Boston College for a number of years when I was in philosophy there, and he was dean of the law school and uh, treasured his uh, uh, collegiality and wisdom and friendship. So we're, we're delighted to have him here tonight. He served as president of the Catholic University of America since 2010, a nationally renowned expert in constitutional law, religious liberty, and the First Amendment. He was dean of the Boston College Law School from 1999 to 2010. Garvey's faith and belief in the Catholic intellectual tradition have played a central role in his teaching and scholarly research, which spanned more than three decades. He served as assistant to the Solicitor General in the U.S. Department of Justice from 1981 to 1984 and authored the wonderful book, What Are Freedoms For? He earned a B.A. from the University of Notre Dame and a J.D. from Harvard. And our MC and occasional commentator and uh, interventionist for the evening, Judge Ken Starr, distinguished academician, lawyer, public servant, and sixth generation Texan. Uh, Judge Ken Starr serves as the chief executive offer, officer of Baylor University, holding the titles of president and chancellor. On June 1st, 2010, Judge Starr began his service as the 14th president to serve Baylor and was named to the position of president and chancellor in 2013. In providing the additional title, he is charged with the task of increasing Baylor's influence in the nation and around the world. Small task. <laughs> Welcome our speakers. Thank you, Dean. <clears throat> in 1787, the Continental Congress uh, enacted the Northwest Ordinance. And then in 1789, the first Congress of the United States uh, meeting in New York uh, re-enacted the ordinance from two years before. It was one of the earliest acts of the new government. It was passed by the House of Representatives, uh, Congressman Wolf, on July the 21st, 1789. So think of how early this is in the new republic. It was passed by the United States Senate on August 4, 1789, and then on August 7th, it didn't take it long to get it down the road to General Washington, and the great man signed the Northwest Ordinance into law. It's still the law of the land. You can still find it. Section 3 of the Northwest Ordinance provides as follows. 
religion, morality, and knowledge being necessary to good government and the happiness of my, mankind, schools and the means of education shall forever be encouraged. Think of the GI Bill. Think of the Moral Land Grant Act uh, of 1863 when the nation was at war, uh, the Civil War. The Congress of the United States took time out to think about education, higher education, the future of the country, and to provide for posterity. Well, here we are. We're on the eve of the National Prayer Breakfast, and we thought, what a propitious uh, occasion, as Mr. Lincoln would say, how fitting and proper, that as part of the extended or ancillary <laughs> festivities surrounding the National Day of Prayer, or the National Prayer Breakfast, I should say, that we pause uh, here in this venerable place uh, where first freedoms rank very high, uh, the first freedoms of uh, a political democracy, to reflect on, and I love the title that John Barry came up with, well done. <laughs> the state of higher education and the calling, well, there's a loaded word, isn't it, of faith-based institutions. In 2007, Anthony Cronman, the uh, renowned uh, dean of the Yale Law School, <clears throat> trained in philosophy, PhD in philosophy, taught philosophy, wrote a troubling book. It was entitled, Education's End, Why Our college, Colleges and Universities Have Given Up on the Meaning of Life. Harry Lewis, the year before, who had been dean, we would now say at Harvard College, provost of Harvard College, but dean of arts and sciences at Harvard College, wrote a book entitled Excellence Without a Soul. For many in a very venerable faith tradition, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world but to lose his soul? And then in the same year that uh, Dean Lewis uh, authored Excellence Without Soul, John Somerville, who had spent his life as an historian in a secular university environment, public university environment, wrote a rather troubling book entitled The Decline of the Secular University. Now that may seem a little bit odd in light of what seems to many cultural commentators to be the march of secularism. So what's going on here? These are large questions, but don't worry. In 45 minutes, we will resolve them all. <laughs> so what is it that we're talking about? And so, Richard, if you would, and thank you both for joining us this evening. Why don't you get the, the ball rolling? I think we would all agree that education is more than a transmission belt. It's more than attending classes and doing lab work and so forth. But what is it? It's a great pleasure to be with you and to be with you and to be with you. Um, I, I always love quoting Will, William Butler Yeats who said that education is not filling a bucket but it's lighting a fire. And that's not mission-driven education and that's not faith-based education. That's education. And um, the challenge that we have today in a secular America for all of us is to say what have we come to expect of higher education for our children and maybe more troubling what is it that the American consumer is looking to get out of a higher education experience uh, one one more anecdote you'll forgive me I had the the, one of the great things about being a university president is occasionally you meet people who are really great people. Um, so I was invited <laughs> to the, in addition to tonight, of course, uh, I, was, uh, I, I was invited with, a, with a, uh, a small but illustrious group of higher educators um, to, uh, to the White House to meet with then President uh, George W. Bush. Um, and uh, his purpose was to meet, these were Jewish higher educators. Um, and. Uh, uh, the point was to talk about education. At a certain point, the president said, uh, uh, I believe that education is terribly important because we have to teach our kids to compete in the global economy. Mm. Now, usually I'm very 
uh, very shy and certainly here, but I'm in the Roosevelt Room of the White House with the President of the United States. I raised my hand, and he, by the way, I'm told he's also a Texan. Um, <laughs> But not, that many, but not that many generations. <laughs> um, not nearly. Yeah. But uh, he, said, <laughs> he said, Richard, I said, Mr. President, I'm sure all of us in the room uh, can agree <laughs> that a purpose of higher education is to teach our kids to compete in the global economy. I said, but I come from Yeshiva University, and our motto is that our education is meant to ennoble and enable. Mm. So for us, it's very important that our kids compete in the global economy, but we need to teach them what are the rules of engagement? What values do they bring to the competition? And once they succeed in the competition, what's their responsibility? The President of the United States looked at me and said, ennoble and enable, I lock that. <laughs> now, of course, I was devastated three weeks later when it did not make its way into the State of the Union. <laughs> I, I recently gave him an honorary degree, and I told him of my lingering resentment. <laughs> he, he asked forgiveness. You, you, you turned the other cheek. <laughs> How Christian of me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> but, but look, for, from, from <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I think my career is finished. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, no, a new career, just we had. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but really profoundly, and I'm sure I'm not, uh, we need to ask the question of what do our children deserve? What do our children deserve? And of course they need to honor thought in all its finer ways. And of course they need to learn the, the wonderful ideas of, the, of, of, of both our country and our civilization. And of course they have to be prepared to, to, to make a living. But they also have to be prepared to live a life. And um, uh, the real question is how do we teach them, and I don't even speak of parochial values, how do they leave the university with a sense of the value of values? Mm. So that is the challenge that, uh, that we all face. I think we are more fortunate to the degree that we're faith-based or, or mission-driven, uh, if only for the fact that our students come knowing to expect that. I don't think that other students don't want it. I don't think they know to ask for it. How's John? That? that was very good. Okay. <laughs> John? I stopped. I mean, yeah. that's really <laughs> impressive. And I'm also a lawyer. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> With no red light on. That <laughs> amazing. <laughs> uh, I'm s uh, it, it's not surprising that I find myself so much in agreement with both of you. I, uh, I think one of the things that I find interesting about recent writings about developments in higher education is that they, uh, they seem to have a hold of, of the notion, which I agree with, that we don't ask enough of education, that our expectations are not high enough. I, I like Richard's phrase, enable and ennoble. Uh, I'm fond of saying that the point of education is uh, to help our students advance in both wisdom and virtue, that these are both things that we do and they're connected to one another um, in, in a surprising way. I, um, Aristotle says, that uh, when we're in the Nicomachean ethics, that when we're educating people, that virtue makes us aim at the right mark, and practical wisdom tells us how to get the right, uh, you know, how to choose the proper means. What he means is <clears throat> that when we're learning about subjects like the history of capitalism or the economy or um, the environment or uh, interpersonal relations or uh, mercantilism, that we can't make uh, proper judgments about these without having an ethical foundation to make our judgments. Our judgments will be, will be better or worse depending on what kind of people we are. In the fine arts, th we, th the, the appreciation of beauty in art, music, poetry, architecture is not in the first instance, an intellectual process. We, we talk about uh, we talk about the experience or the love of beauty, and these aren't just metaphors. That our understanding of beautiful things is will be good or meretricious depending on what kind of people we are. And I think that there is an old notion, well, not much older than the 19th century, uh, that uh, that young people come to college. Uh, to grow into f uh, adults who are virtuous people and good citizens. And I think the, the writings that you're referring to are 
an effort to retrieve this notion, and I think we should. There seems to be skepticism, though, in the culture <coughs> uh, about faith having a role in the academic enterprise. Richard, what does faith have to do with the life of the mind? Well, I think, I think it comes to the, the initial conceptualization of, of, of the worth of a human. Mm. And whether we are simply the highest animals in the food chain, or whether, <laughs> or whether there's something noble about us, or sacred. The, in Hebrew, the word for sacred is kodesh, and it's been defined uh, uh, holy. But, but the real definition of it is that it is noble, it is special for a purpose. And, and I think one of the concerns that we have to have for American society is do we teach our children that they're noble? Do we teach them that they're, they're, they're supposed to do more than graze and, and, and make money and go shopping? Um, and uh, I don't know how you do that if you buy into no higher purpose, to no, um, um, uh, no, no sense of a connectedness with the cosmos. And, um, uh, and yet, I also understand that in America, unless you choose to go to a mission-driven or faith-based university, you want to go somewhere where you're not having, you don't have to buy in to an orthodoxy. But it seems to me that we've gone a little too far to divorce that sense of struggling with the essence of the human being and saying it's too dangerous in our pluralistic society to deal with it, so therefore just deal with, with arts and science. And I think we're impoverished by that. And frankly, I think the intellectual pursuit of the ideas of the disciplines are, are poorer because we don't dare to think about where the human comes from and where the human's going. John, do you think that's a fair critique of uh, a non-faith-based institution of higher ed? I do. These discussions about what the role of faith is in an institution of higher education usually begin on, on the left foot. You know, there is this implication that it somehow makes the study of physics or of biology difficult because it'll put up barriers to your, <clears throat> to your understanding of them. I, for Catholics, this makes no sense whatever. The, uh, it, uh, there, it was uh, a, a Catholic priest, uh, Georges Lemaitre, who, who uh, proposed the theory of the Big Bang. It was an Augustinian friar, Gregor Mendel, who invented the modern science of genetics. So it, it's the, the notion that their faith was somehow impeding them in their inquiries is hard to get a hold of. I, it's one of the virtues that I was talking about. <coughs> it, uh, it, uh, it's faith that inspires art, music, literature, poetry. It's faith that gives us a way to understand uh, history, to make laws, to govern the economy, to, um, to, to build a culture and a society. I don't think that we can have a, a full university if we leave it out. We pause to have uh, a not-so-noble moment. Do you see this device? This device, until moments ago, was interfering with the recording uh, and transmission of this. And I'm not the only guilty party. All panelists. Such a noble conversation and such an ignoble reminder that we need to really turn off our cell phones. <laughs> but I can't be a human if I don't have my cell phone. <laughs> not, not, not true. Stripped of his dignity. You know that the average American checks his cell phone 34 times a day? Only? Hmm? 34? That's not on the Sabbath. <laughs> let's, let's then look at another angle, and this is the critique, uh, the familiar critique of faith-based uh, education, which is faith-based education will come at the expense of academic freedom. Of course, we don't subscribe to that. Really? Um, but uh, but, but um, you're a great lawyer. What, what is your rebuttal? Well, I, look, I, first of all, from, from my university, um, uh, which, is, uh, which is grounded in the Jewish tradition, the Jewish tradition believes that there are no bad ideas, that you should explore everything, but that you bring a moral and ethical and purposeful judgment 
to how we relate to those ideas. So ideas are never the enemy. It's how we, how we perhaps abuse or pervert those ideas. So in, in our institution, uh, and by, let me also say every university in the country makes choices as to what they teach and what they don't teach. Right? Whether it's a political dogma that they impose, whether it's political correctness, whether there are only so many courses that can be offered in a curriculum, but I, most of the faith-based schools that I know offer a very broad liberal arts um, uh, curriculum. I know in our, our university, our faculty are by no means all orthodox or all Jewish or all of any one type. Uh, and when we talk about hiring them, we don't ask them to sign into a catechism. We do say that you shouldn't come here if you're not at least sympathetic to the, the ethos of the university. Um, uh, so, so I would imagine that there are things that people would want to teach that we would say, go elsewhere for that teaching. But, but my faculty would very properly be in high dudgeon if I would say, please submit your curricula to our rabbinic staff and they're going to go through it. Uh, in fact, we have enough confidence in our, in our ethos and in our values to believe that our ideals can confront ideas and hopefully shape them. And if people choose not to, that's the beauty of society. People have a right to say no. And John, how do you respond to the critique that academic freedom is going to be eroded, compromised, sacrificed? You know, uh, um, it's interesting to listen in, in, a, in a dispassionate um, frame of mind to discussions about this question because it's one where uh, left and right, secular and religious groups often talk past one another or find one another, uh, find themselves engaging in practices that are in fact identical to the others. I, I, I would say that at a, at a faith-based university we are uh, the, the meaning of academic freedom and its significance is uh, in every respect similar to what it is at secular universities, except that in some ways I would say we're more free. I, I speak as somebody who spent half his career at the University of Kentucky, a Baptist institution. <laughs> is that a, the is University that, is that of a Michigan. Is that a, is that <laughs> Uh, no, it's a public school. I taught. I taught at their law school. I taught First Amendment law at their um, at their law school. So I paid a lot of attention to what the First Amendment said. And I and I should say that I uh, there were at the University of Kentucky proper limits on the enthusiasm I could express for my own Catholic beliefs. There were not um, the, the the First Amendment. Of course, permits me to explore them at a at a public school. But I but. But there are, I think, properly limits when I'm an employee of the state being paid a state salary to the extent to which I can go to persuade students to my way of thinking. I, uh, that's part of what we mean by, um, by not having an establishment of religion. But it's also part of what we mean by a limitation on academic freedom to argue my own case. So I, uh, I don't, I, I think that the sorts of critiques from the outside of the limitations you find in religious schools are often made in a, uh, in a sort of um, uh, a blindness to what happens elsewhere. Let me give another example of this. Um, this is an example sometimes presented as a question of academic freedom, although I think in each case it's not properly so. Um, a few years ago, the University of Notre Dame invited um, President Obama to be its commencement speaker and gave him an honorary degree. <coughs> and this caused a great deal of, of discussion um, both within Catholic circles and within non-Catholic academic circles. Um, it was uh, the American Catholic bishops said, you know, we think this is improper uh, f um, not to have him speak on campus, which he would be welcome to do, but to give him an award uh, an honorary degree and hold him up for uh, for emulation as the commencement speaker. Their 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 um, uh, document. It's called Catholics in Political Life. Says that we shouldn't uh, politicians shouldn't be given awards, honors, or platforms which would suggest support for points of view that are at variance with 
the Catholic point of view. So it's a question not about whether he would be free to speak there, but about whether the university should endorse him as a, okay, that's, that's one example. Compare it with this nearly identical example. Every year uh, we see in the newspaper, come May or June, a uh, complaint usually filed by the American Civil Liberties Union against a state university. Uh, the one I'm thinking of is uh, there was a pastor from the, from the um, Community Alliance Church um, who was the commencement speaker at Montana State University and he gave an invocation at the university and the ACLU said, can't do this. And as you and you and I know, the First Amendment rule that we apply in cases like this is one that Justice O'Connor stated in Lynch against Donnelly that, that uh, although it would be fine to have Pastor Zerger come to Montana State University and even to preach and say prayers and meet with the students, still having him at commencement, holding him up for emulation, is an endorsement of him which the university as a state institution shouldn't be making about a religious a religious figure. Not essentially different from what the Catholic bishops were saying. In both cases, the person was welcome to speak. In both cases, the rule was, that's fine. Uh, we just don't want to endorse him as um, holding views that, that we put forth as our own. So I think this talk about <laughs> academic freedom is, is sometimes a little disingenuous in, in, on both sides. I, I, uh, I, I happen to agree with the First Amendment rule about Montana State and also with the American Catholic bishops. Let's switch uh, to talking about the students. At Baylor, we love to say it's all about the students. <coughs> That's why we're there. A university without students is a research center or, or think tank. The students come, they engage with faculty, with staff, but they engage with, with one another, but it's wise for there to be guidance for that process, for it to be intentional. Tell us about your philosophy towards student life at Yeshiva and how that might differ from your secular counterpart down the, down the road? Well, it's, a, it's, it's a wonderful question. I, I have been driven a lot by the notion that what we do as university educators is create communities that are models for what the citizenship of our students are when they leave this home, this community, and go on to the American scene. And, and I worry about where students today get the, the kind of ethical ammunition for what makes America, America. What is our civilization? I joked before, beyond shopping. But, but these days, it's a real question. I also think profoundly, and I'm sure you agree, that this generation of young students are a gift to us because more than anything, they want to matter. Mm. Now, it's partly because of the cell phone. It's partly because of, of, of instant news and the news cycle where everything that's happening in the world is directly in our face instantaneously. So young people think everything is within their reach, and yet they are virtually powerless to impact on any of it. So how do I matter is very important. And I think the, the fuel that we get to give in a university is to say you matter because you're a sensate human being who is given the gift of responsibility. And here's a wonderfully selfish life experience called college mm -hmm. where you get to invest in ideas, where you get to grow, where you get to explore thoughts. But here's where I differ. <coughs> but in an environment that, that, that reinforces your purpose. Not just to have these ideas, but to know what to do with them. So therefore, the student body, um, let me give you a little bit of Jewish, uh, uh, of Jewish trivia. Right? We, <laughs> we talk about the experience at Yeshiva University as undergraduates is as one of shalemut. The word shalemut means wholeness or integrity. It comes from the word shalem, which means whole, which you all know is like the word shalom, which means peace. But peace really means wholeness, integrity. The pieces of who we are fit together, whether it's an individual or society. So we have articulated that at yeshiva, the goal of the undergraduate education is to provoke the student to have his or her pieces come together. 
my intellectual peace, my dreaming peace, my service to society peace, my aspiration for career, right? my communal peace. How do I get whole so I get to have that great gift, which is responsibility? And, and that translates itself into service learning missions, into, into uh, uh, we, have, we have much in terms of religious guidance, um, not just from clergy, but from counselors. We have uh, profound counseling centers. But I think it's much more than that. Because they're small liberal arts and business schools, there is a sense of community, and the faculty um, really engage with the students. One classic way is to engage them in their scholarship. We have our students who do research with their faculty. But another way is to have those late night conversations where you get to talk about ideas that matter and the, and the endless discussion of themes that are endless, as, uh, um, as uh, um, John Macefield said. Um, and I, I think that with, with um, we, send, uh, we send students on all our breaks to alternative uh, break trips. Uh, so I had uh, 36 uh, um, uh, Yeshiva University students in, in Haiti over the break. Uh, unfortunately, there's still an enormous amount of, of, of rescue and, and renewal work to be done there. For me to have Orthodox Jews, who, by the way, will spend their lives in the larger world, but in communities of Orthodox Jews, <coughs> to understand that there's a mandate by their civilization to matter in the world and to reach out to others is something that we can model for them in college. And it's those type of things. We, we, we are, are, uh, one of our main campuses is in the Washington Heights area of Manhattan, which is a large Dominican community. And we have many of our students engaged in teaching science to middle school Dominicans who otherwise won't have a science enrichment program. And we, I'll give you one more example. In the summer, we have a program called Counterpoint where we send 100 student volunteers to the Negev, to the south of Israel. To, to run day camps teaching English to uh, Israelis who are basically either underprivileged Ethiopians or mm. from Azerbaijan. Mm. And it's an extraordinary experience because they realize the, the, the breadth of the Jewish experience, but also understand that you get to impact just by being with other people. That's why, that's why simply to have a, uh, uh, an online school where I'll log in and take my courses and get my degree is not an education. It's a downloading of information. That doesn't mean that there's not room for online and blended education, mm -hmm. but in the context of a campus community. And John, student it, life at Catholic University. <coughs> is um, s uh, alike in surprising ways to what, uh, what Richard has just described at Yeshiva. I, I too am fond of saying that <clears throat> that the strongest argument that we can make for the kind of education we give as compared to, say, um, he, uh, online education is, again, that our, uh, that our university is concerned with forming students in both wisdom and virtue, and that that's not something we can do electronically. In, in, in the second case, uh, our students, too, spend, <clears throat> spend time in Haiti, make summer trips to <clears throat> to mission um, places. It, um, I have said frequently uh, at the university that, that everything we do from residence life to food services to athletics to student organizations and campus ministry are all part of the education of our students no less than what happens in the classroom. This is something that you, this is a theme that you see in the books that you were referring to uh, like Tony Cronman's book or <clears throat> There's a book that everybody's reading last summer by William Duresowitz called Excellent Sheep. Did you happen, mm -hmm. to, yes. happen to read this about the miseducation of the American elite? And his, uh, his point was that we, that we disserve our, our <clears throat> college students by just imparting information to them and helping them to pass exams. That he, his argument is that we need to prepare them to establish their own values, as he says, and engage in voyages of self-discovery. It was another book that was getting reviewed last summer, too, uh, by our counterpart at Wesleyan, Michael Roth, uh, called um, Beyond the University. And Roth, too, says, look, it's not just about uh, passing on information or, <coughs> or learning skills. It's about <coughs> raising free and autonomous individuals who will participate in society. I, I think that 
what I like about these books is that the, the, it, it's a welcome turn of events for <coughs> for university presidents to say that education is about more than knowledge and skills. It's about preparing people for the kind of life that they're going to lead. Of course, <coughs> these are all alike in the sense that they all want to prepare students to be good 20th century liberals, that, um, you know, engage in voyages of self-discovery, become free and autonomous and self-determining, uh, chart your own course and so on. And so the, the last step of what they're proposing, I think, is different from what each of our schools proposes. We, we say, don't just choose your own values, but that there may be some values that people commonly share and that uh, we ought to encourage people to look at. We say, not just that people should ask life's big questions, but that there may be some answers to life's big <laughs> questions. And we have some suggestions about places you may look in our traditions for you to, for you to find them. So we're different um, in where we get to, but at least for the first time in, in half a century, universities are saying, you know, maybe it's not just about giving them what we could give them electronically. We're going to invite you to participate in the conversation. <coughs> Uh, by National Press Club style, if you'd be kind enough to jot down your question uh, for the panel. They'll be picked up and uh, we'll uh, move to that part of the conversation soon. Let's move to the challenges. Of, you know, the, it is the increasingly secular uh, age. There are various and sundry challenges from various and sundry regulators. Reflect on what you see as the key challenges to faith-based education. Richard? Well, it's interesting, um, uh, Ken. I, I think I'll defer to you in terms of the issue of regulators. To me, the major challenge is for parents and students to know that this is something worthy of their investing in. Mm -hmm. In other words, we've built institutions and ideas that we know are ripe for students to grow in. And because we are all private universities, I know that for me the hardest, the hardest <coughs> aspect is convincing my own constituency that given the cost of private education, um, the choice of investing is a value proposition mm. that's worthwhile. And it's painful to me because I'm basically directing these pleas to people of my community who understand what kind of a life they want to have and they want their children to have. And yet the notion, and we have a double curriculum. Our students take the equivalent of 30 credits a semester. Um, our swimming pool's open till 2 in the morning because they don't get to it till 11. Um, uh, but, but for me, the challenge is that to the degree that society has accepted the notion that education is credentialing for career, mm. okay, then people will look where they can get the best deal to get the requisite credential. And, uh, and that's my largest frustration. I might add in that uh, regard that the uh, US Department of Education is proposing uh, a rating system for all American colleges and universities. And the ratings, when you analyze it, it's in a comment period, but the education department seems to be moving inexorably in that direction. We'll really look at issues, graduation rates, all these things are important, but they will be looking at outcomes entirely in terms of a George W. Bush, are you prepared to compete, compete. In, the, in the global uh, economy? So there's a ratification that is underway by the administration uh, which, by the way, is uh, triggering enormous opposition uh, from all institutions. There doesn't seem to be any divide at all that this is a reductionist uh, approach that simply won't even take into account the mission. What is it that the university, the college, is trying to, to accomplish? It may very well be that the mission of the particular institution is to reach out to at-risk communities, first-generation communities. The retention rates, the graduation rates, and the other objective indicia of institutional success 
will be very modest. What will happen if the education department then gives that institution, perhaps a Catholic institution, in a very small inner city kind of enclave, gives that institution an F without, again, having assessed at all the nature of the community that the institution is, is trying to solve. John? I'm, I'm tempted to say when I'm asked by reporters what I think about this that I'm in favor of a government system of rating newspapers on there. <laughs> I, uh, I'll bite on your earlier question. I, um, although I think that the kinds of legal developments that we see um, aren't initiated by the government but grow out of the direction the culture is going in. But there, uh, let me mention too that I've noticed in, <clears throat> in the last few years that have um, that have affected universities. One is a one is a kind of tendency to insist that schools adopt a peculiarly modern form of sexual orthodoxy. Uh, I think in the first place of the HHS Preventive Services mandate that directs the Catholic University of America to provide contraceptives and early form abortion, early term abortions to their students, which are things that they frown on, but also. Think about the, the recent, there's, uh, Title IX has been much in the papers lately, and I think in some ways this is, a, this is a healthy development, but the kind of regulations we're seeing from the Department of Education about Title IX view sex as a normal, healthy, everyday activity that students ought to be freely engaging in so long as it's not coercive. And the, and the, the new uh, mantra is uh, yes means yes. You, you, you need affirmative consent before you can engage in sex. But at Catholic University, I, I'm fond of saying to our students that yes means no, that, <laughs> that this is something that we view as uh, more sacred than the culture does and ought to be attended to in marriage and not outside it. So, but, you know, the, the government is putting forward a very different view of that sort of activity. That's one set of things, and there are, there are more examples. Uh, I mean, for example, the intolerance of traditional views of marriage. But, but another one which concerns me is the, the sort of indifference that we see to the autonomy of religious institutions. The, uh, we saw the, the EEOC and the Department of Justice both um, insisting on imposing anti-discrimination laws on a Lutheran school in Hosanna Tabor. Uh, just, um, just before Christmas, the National <coughs> Labor Relations Board said it had jurisdiction to supervise negotiations about the terms and conditions of employment by, by faculty at religious universities. And I just, uh, I think it, it shows a kind of lack of appreciation for the difference that religious schools properly have if they're to do their work in the culture. I, I, I just Please. want to add, I, I, I think you'd agree, I think secular institutions are equally troubled by this. I don't want to suggest that every secular institution is simply a pre-professional school. Right? They might not have the mm -hmm. same direction <coughs> excuse me, to create sacred communities, but they certainly want to, want to provoke thinking and they want to provoke independent thought. They want young people, uh, I mean, they, I, some of them even agree with what we're saying, but they're saying they don't know how to impose the value of values in a uh, in such a pluralistic environment. But uh, this is not the faith-based institutions against the government as opposed to secular institutions. I mm -hmm. think it's a, it's a broad concern about what's appropriate <coughs> guidance and intervention from the government. We have in the uh, audience <coughs> uh, a distinguished uh, observer of the condition of higher education, the former dean of the Duke Divinity School, who has made a very interesting uh, observation about faith-based institutions of higher learning that in addition to their own role historically traditionally as a place a seat of learning it also they have a, a larger role to play to serve as it were as a keystone institution for the faith more generally for the faith community outside the student body outside the faculty outside the alumni do you reflect on that what is the role of yeshiva in the broader community of Orthodox Judaism? Well, I'd go more broadly. I, 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 we reflect a great deal on the role uh, of yeshiva uh, having an impact on 
standards of Western civilization and the culture, but certainly let me be more, more Catholic, um, or no, less Catholic, more mm -hmm. parochial, um, <laughs> and, and say certainly we look at our responsibility as the um, kind of the flagship of, uh, of a strong Jewish um, education. Uh, we look at it in many ways. I mean, our graduate school of education is providing most of the day school teachers in the network of Jewish day schools. Uh, the graduates of our rabbinical school uh, fill uh, 90 percent of the orthodox pulpits. <coughs> but more than that, in an age of, of great assimilation, in an age of people eschewing orthodoxies of any type, the question is, without looking at everybody and saying, boy, you're no good because you're not orthodox like we are, and how absurd a statement that is, we kind of recognize the notion that as the world is more and more, um, um, secular is probably the wrong word, but more and more assimilated, more and more one-world-like, um, the Jewish tradition and the Jewish family uh, needs a... Uh, a traditional core that seizes its responsibility, not proselytizing, but reaching a hand out and say that, at least for the Jewish story, if we don't have a profound sense of both history and destiny, if we don't know our story, it's not an ignorant faith, it, has to, it requires lots of knowledge. If we don't have our students do it, and if we don't offer programs to the community, and if we don't encourage the building of these strong communities, then we think that the, the ongoing Jewish story in the diaspora is imperiled. Mm. So we think about that a great deal. Um, by the same token, we have to think about how we do that through our primary mission, which is education. Now, there's lifetime education, but primarily, right, we're in business for the student community that we have. I think John, one you're of the, the one of the glories of <coughs> the American system of higher education that we have this kind of pluralism among our institutions. And just, just to, to speak from 30,000 feet about the phenomenon, it, it, it's good for consumers of higher education to have different institutions offering different uh, menus in the same way that it's good for consumers of picnic goods to have a lot of varieties of mustard in the, you know, it's not a Soviet kind of store where everybody's got to have French's. At, um, and, uh, I, I think it's really important. You, you don't see this in, uh, you don't see it in, just to take a simple example, in countries with an established church. You know, there are no great Catholic universities in the United Kingdom, which is certainly a liberal society and uh, has great educational institutions, but they've been run by the government, which uh, was united with the faith, and uh, the government has supported religion there. Uh, in America, we've, because of our First Amendment, allowed institutions like ours or forced institutions like ours to grow up and survive under their own um, uh, um, steam. And that's been a really good thing. It would be unfortunate if in the name of, of um, I don't know, academic freedom, diversity, what uh, choose your value, the government were to insist that we become more like one another, more more diverse internally to the point where we're all like the University of Kentucky rather than like Yeshiva Baylor and the Catholic University of America. I think it's a great thing for, for the intellectual life of America that we have our institutions. It is frequently said that uh, the history of higher education in America, which for so long was the history of religiously affiliated uh, education, uh, the founders of Brown University one came uh, of, uh, of Baylor University, one came from Brown University, then a very strong Baptist institution. Uh, the University of Chicago, David Brooks says famously, the University of Chicago, a, a Baptist university where atheist professors teach Aquinas to Jewish students. <laughs> so, no, welcome, welcome to, to, uh, to uh, America, but what does seem to, to unite in all of the <coughs> diversity is, is, is a genuine commitment to freedom, and we hope that that commitment is continuing, and the culture of freedom. It is one of the glories of the American experience that we have not come close to an authoritarian regime. 
for all of the complaints about the inefficiencies of government, those inefficiencies nonetheless have yielded up a uh, remarkably free society. That is, of course, our, our great, uh, uh, it, it is now our challenge to maintain that in the 21st century. Uh, questions uh, from the community? Uh, I don't want our time to expire without giving the audience its First Amendment opportunity to be heard. After you censor the questions. Okay, we have some <laughs> duplicative. <laughs> All right, very good. Thank you. As usual, Tommy Lou is telling me exactly what to say. Thank you. <laughs> What is lost when an aggressive secularism uh, tries to marginalize faith-based institutions? Don't both speak at once. <laughs> I think it's the sort of thing we were just talking about. Uh, it, it isn't uh, that aggressive secularism uh, wouldn't be a welcome option at its own uh, university. Um, it is a loss, though, to the intellectual life if um, th the norms of the culture m move us all to, uh, to follow the same pattern. I, and let me say that I, d that I think we're far from that sort of culture in America. Like you, I have, I have great hope for, for the intellectual future of American thought and that the greatest danger I see is not an aggressive secularism but a sort of Twitter culture where our deep thought on things is limited to 140 characters. Mm. I think that's a greater danger mm -hmm. than secularism. Mm. But, it's, but it's a real challenge. Mm. Richard? Well, I was going to say, it's a, you're, you're dating us because we all come from a time where the word you had a Y in it. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of just being you. <coughs> Look, I, I don't know that an aggressive secularism is targeting, is targeting particularism. I think it creates a correctness that requires more courage to, to speak to an orthodoxy. I mean, the culture on, a, on campus is profoundly individualistic when the Jewish tradition is a, a, a profound nuance of me and we. Um, uh, an orthodoxy uh, which any of our family might bring uh, to a campus um, is not derided but it's certainly counter to the culture that's one of mm -hmm. individualism and of, of, of kind of uh, uh, a, uh, um, in terms of, of sexuality as a kind of consent uh, uh, driven, uh, a, a, pass, a, a casual intimacy is what I'm trying to say. And, uh, and if you don't buy into that somehow, uh, you're, ro you're wrong. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think it, it targets, I think we might be casualties of the culture. And I think it's important to think that because rather than just have an enemies list. Uh... Here's a very practical uh, question. Are you observing a drop in interest and enrollment in faith-based institutions? Well, we, we've never had more students, but we have a very small niche market and, and we work very hard to convince them that this is a, uh, a critical choice. To me, it's not that there are fewer people who, um, uh, who, who buy into the club, but I'm not sure, I think people are, it, it costs a lot these days to live. Mm -hmm. And it's certainly where you always have panels on the cost of being Jewish. And I always say, let's not have that discussion. Let's talk about the cost of being uh, uh, because Jewish isn't the, isn't the fungible piece to that. Um, but, but I think that, that, um, uh, I think that, that's, the, that's the problem. We have more students than we've ever had, but, but we're giving out more scholarship aid than we've ever given. We're working harder to, not to retain those students. We have a very, very profoundly low um, uh, transfer uh, uh, rate, and we have a very high graduation rate. But, but making that first deal in, a, in an economic environment that we have now is, is a challenge. Yeah, I think the same is true at Catholic University. I, I, to speak in, in uh, business-like terms, differentiation within the market is a good thing in times <laughs> when you're trying to distinguish yourself from other people. And there's certainly, uh, it, we're not nearly the sort of niche market that, uh, that Yeshiva Thanks. is operating in. There's, a, there's <laughs> way more Catholics, as you know, and, uh, and 
uh, and people who who are hungry for the the kind of um, unique experience, intellectual experience, and life experience that we offer at the university. So um, let me just give one little example. <coughs> um, four years ago, I wrote a piece in the Wall Street Journal saying that we were going to go back to single-sex residence halls at Catholic University, and I said, look, uh, you know, f for me this is a, and for my wife this is a sort of this grows naturally out of our having raised five children and knowing a lot about what people are interested in between 18 and 21. But there's really good data to show that, <laughs> that um, rates of binge drinking are double um, in co-ed dorms, what they are in single-sex dorms, and rates of hooking up are astronomically higher. And these are, these are things that are um, connected with bad outcomes for your kids, you know, rates of uh, death and injury from drinking too much, rates of depression from hooking up. So, you know, if, if you want to put it on strictly secular terms, this this is a sensible thing to do. I, I was worried and I was told by several people, this is a really bad move, nobody's going to come here anymore. I, actually, our, 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 um, our yield went up, our class mm -hmm. was bigger than we expected, and it's it's proven to be a popular thing. Not with everybody, you know, it isn't the experience <laughs> that everybody wants, but for those mm -hmm. who are looking for it, there aren't so many options, and we're we're a good one. And I'm pleased to report that applications are at an all-time high <coughs> at Baylor University, so we're thankful for that. Uh, let's return to the academic uh, side of the conversation. How can faith-based scholars and universities address accusations of bias and parochialism? Well, I think bias is easy to address. We we don't we don't practice it. We're uh, uh, our, our, our policies uh, in, in terms of, uh, of education and attracting faculty and the like, uh, we certainly want people to subscribe to the perspective of the vision, but there's, there's no bias. So certainly for Yeshiva University, um, there's, uh, there's no prejudice in hiring or in accepting or in, uh, uh, or in dealing with, with who's on the faculty. Uh, parochialism, I want to plead guilty. <laughs> our, our institution is about parochialism. It's about <laughs> enshrining the values of a community that we think is critically important to go on. But in defining that parochialism, we define it as an essential part of the American character and the American uh, vision. But I don't want to apologize for parochialism. I think it's a wonderful answer, and I, I, I agree with, uh, w with what you've just said, and also with an observation that you made earlier, that in, in building an intellectual culture, uh, in successfully building an intellectual culture, um, institutions necessarily have to make choices about the kinds of people they're going to hire and the kinds of scholarship and work that they're going to encourage. Think about, uh, I, I don't know, think, think about the School of Legal History built at the University of Wisconsin's law school. You know that for years there was a great school of legal history. That's because they hired people on the faculty who were interested in uh, in doing things the way they're History department did it, or or uh, uh, think about Stanley Fish and the 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 movement that he started at Duke University in the English department. They, they they had a whole English department that moved in that direction, and that's a really great thing for the intellectual life. In the same way, if you want to build a serious Catholic intellectual life, somebody's got to carry the ball. So uh, you you want to pay attention to that. That's not the same as bias or discrimination. It's it's institution building. We have a number of questions uh, relating to uh, global experience, uh, international experiences. We have touched on that, and what you're were commenting with respect to the, to the Haitian outreach and so forth. But this was an intriguing question. As an educational consultant, I am disappointed by the service to international students from American public universities. Do you think faith-based universities do better with international students? I, I don't know what, what the, uh, what the uh, American public universities do with international students, so I have no, no, no way of saying that. I do know that um, in terms of international students, we have students from uh, multiple different lands, and, um, and there are challenges to cultural assimilation to an American experience, but in our case, they're coming because they want to be in a Jewish community. So the givens and the shared givens are there, so I think we do very well with that. I think, I think the challenge of having, uh, 
um, people from other lands is what's the culture they encounter. And again, one of my concerns, having nothing to do with international students, is what is the culture on American university campuses? What is the ethos uh, uh, that's, that's, that's being modeled? That's a real challenge to me. It's a complicated question. Uh, there are so many parts to it. For example, international students um, can't avail themselves of federal financial assistance on campuses. There, there are any number of ways in which we're less friendly than we should be to to people who want to come to this country and get an education and maybe become become part of it, which which we can all do better at. I, um, the the matter of cultural adjustments is a is a more interesting one. And at Catholic University too, I think people come. Um, often expecting or finding a particular kind of intellectual community. One of the most interesting um, cases of this that we have seen in the last few years was um, a, a story that I think Michelle Borstein wrote it in the, in the Post uh, about the fact that um, in, in the first couple of years of my term as, <clears throat> as president, the number of Muslim students at Catholic University had more than doubled. Now, it's not an astronomical number, but it had gone into the hundreds from, from a lower number and uh, she came to introduce to, to interview the the students and uh, thinking you know this is an odd sort of cultural misfit you know you're Muslims they're Catholics didn't they do the Crusades aren't you uh, um, historical um, uh, opponents and the students most of whom are fairly orthodox the women cover their heads the men are, are fairly Orthodox said, said, gosh, no, we love it here. I mean, we're not weird. We're, uh, the women cover their heads. They've got nuns that cover their heads. We fast during Ramadan. They fast during Lent. We, we pray five times a day. People go to Mass every day here. We, it's like normal. We, 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 we like it. It's not an unusual reaction. We have uh, a growing uh, Muslim population at Baylor, and the families uh, feel comfortable. Yeah, the women... The students uh, feel uh, the women at Catholic and their families uh, were particularly happy yes. about the single-sex dorms, yes. which they were very uncomfortable with. Yeah, yeah we don't yet have a Muslim population. population. Yeah. Yeah. No. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. And we've always yeah, no had we've <laughs> always had single-sex dorms separated by five miles, <laughs> <laughs> because we too know yeah, what trusting, goes through young people's minds. Yeshiva's two-campus policy. That's correct. <laughs> I'm tempted to tell a story from Baylor, but time is escaping, so I'll tell it afterwards. <laughs> this is an important one, and this may close our time together. I'm getting the nod, or the hook. What is the role of faith-based universities in addressing and publicizing growing anti-Semitism and anti-Christian persecution worldwide and, provocatively, on U.S. campuses? Let me begin. You go first. Uh, let me begin <laughs> with that one, uh, because I, uh, I um, th this is a phenomenon that has been more serious in recent years in Europe, but is not unknown uh, in American, particularly in American intellectual circles. The uh, the, the 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 divestiture. What's the um, the, uh, um, DBS. campaign? DBS campaigns on. Among some uh, American academic groups, have been have been uh, tinged with anti-Semitism. I, I think it is really important for religious, um, for faith-based universities, in a situation like this, to stand up and speak out against anti-Semitism, uh, and that they are the natural place to look for um, for that sort of voice for the same kinds of reasons that I just mentioned about the Muslim students on our campus. Because we understand uh, the importance of being um, in a pluralistic society, uh, um, uh, a minority religion uh, off from others, and, and we, need to, um, we need to speak out, especially those of us who are larger than the Jewish community. Because this, uh, this is a phenomenon that, alas, is thousands of years old and we Christian universities have had, or we Christians have had our own part in it. I, I think it's really important that we speak out. So I, uh, I was among those when I was the president of the Hillel Foundation during the 90s, I was very pleased that what I naively thought was the death of anti-Semitism. Mm. That, uh, uh, that it really wasn't, uh, the, the Anti-Defamation League 
uh, would annually say that uh, there is anti-Semitism, but the safest place for Jews is on the American college campus. And that was very hopeful to me because I thought the next generation would be different. But alas, it's not to be. Um, I, uh, I have the privilege of hosting a delegation of uh, 18 uh, cardinals and archbishops from the Holy See every year who come to Yeshiva University because they want to see the truth. Um, uh, <laughs> but, um, uh, but, but, but they are more pained than I am. They are more pained than I am about, about this recurrence. And yes, it's primarily in, in, in Europe and other parts of the world, but it's there lingering and in some ways growing. Um, I think you have to just confront it and say that hatred is hatred. Uh, uh, someone once asked, my chairman when I was at Hillel was the late Edgar Bronfman. And mm. he was involved in a whole series of getting the Swiss bankers to acknowledge that they had stolen mm. hundreds of millions of dollars from mm. victims of the, of the Holocaust. And I remember that he was being interviewed once by a reporter. And, and, he, uh, and the reporter asked him, he said, Mr. Bronfman, aren't you afraid that all your activism here will provoke anti-Semitism? And he said, Jews don't create anti-Semitism. Anti-Semites create <laughs> anti-Semitism. <laughs> but the last thing I'll say to this is, as important as that is, my biggest concern for my community is, is not about anti-Semitism. Uh, the same Edgar Bronfman once had a, he became the head of the World Jewish Congress. And he had an audience with the late Rabbi Joseph B. Soloveitchik, who was the, the philosophic and rabbinic um, uh, leader of what we call modern orthodoxy. And uh, Edgar told me that he went to Rabbi Soloveitchik and he said, Rabbi Soloveitchik, I've just been elected president of the World Jewish Congress. What advice do you have for me? And he said, Mr. Bronfman, I want you to remember that the Jewish people were created for more than fighting anti-Semitism. If we want our children to be whole, they have to know who they are, not who hates us. Mm -hmm. And it's not enough to provoke identity by being united against the other. Right? And a whole lot of what we do, and frankly what universities should do, is encourage people to know who they are, to know their heritage, to know their aspirations, to know deep thoughts, but to realize that the freedom that we enjoy um, is, not, uh, is not what Chris Christopherson wrote, that freedom is just another word for nothing left to lose, mm -hmm. right? But, the, you know, when mm -hmm. in our synagogues we're reading now the passages that precede Passover. So it's the exodus from Egypt. And, you know, the Jewish people, when they, the, the Hebrews, the, the children of Israel, when they left um, um, Egypt uh, and they crossed the Red Sea, were free in a desert, alone, with no food and no water but they were free. But the lesson was, for all of us, that freedom really is, is going forward several weeks later to Mount Sinai and using our freedom to commit to take responsibility for life. You know, at the, in this wonderful city at the Korean War Memorial, engraved on the wall is a statement that says, freedom is not free. Maybe the most important thing we can educate our children to is that the gift of freedom is the gift of responsibility, and they have to educate themselves to see how they direct themselves that way. It has been said, rightly or wrongly, fairly or unfairly, that too many American universities are focusing on the resume virtues, but that faith-based institutions at their best are focused on the eulogy <laughs> virtues. Would you join me in thanking our wonderful <laughs> colleagues, Richard and John. They were terrific. Thank you, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, John. Thank you for joining us.